So my goal today, being the day after I turned 30 yesterday, is going to be relaying 10 of my biggest lessons learned along the way through these different phases of life um, that have stuck with me and been very helpful to me. So hopefully they're going to be helpful for you. And so let's dive in. Number one is, and I think I can do this on the Jamboard. So the first piece, number one, lessons I learned by 30. I wish I knew earlier. We're going to go number one. This is going to be the easiest way to set yourself apart from 95% of people. What I'm learning now is I've been adulting for long enough is just do what you say you are going to do. If you can do that, you are going to set yourself apart from so many people. And the reason I say that, and I can tell a couple stories, is just be on time. And so for me and Nicole, when we when we first bought a house, um, kind of what happened there. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not even sharing the screen. So as far as the first piece is going to be just do what you are do what you say you are going to do. Be dependable. So when we had uh, we asked plumbers to come, you know, do some plumbing stuff. And hey, we're gonna be there at 1 p.m. No one shows, and we're like, hey, what's going on? We took the day off, et cetera, et cetera. And so no one showed up and we rescheduled it. So we called them the next day. We're like, hey, what happened? They were like, oh, we got busy. Our bad. And we're like, okay, so kind of that 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 expends a little bit of karma. And so the next piece, we call them, have them come back. And I think they no-showed again. And we're like, okay, now we're the reputation of that company is now being diminished. And so later on, they they actually, we rescheduled them again. They came in, amazing group. They were really nice guys. They did the work. They were tremendous. But now it's like, I would love to be able to give a positive um, reflection on them, but it's like always going to be that stinger of they did not uphold that expectation. So one thing I've learned, if you can just do what you say you're going to do, you're going to set yourself apart. Because so I've seen this not only there, but just doing that and being dependable can really set you up for being um, excellent in this kind of, in this season, in 2024. And I think I had another story on this as well. And this comes in terms of, you know, in hiring for my company, I've been able to have some hiring rounds and just like, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that even when some people value, you know, putting on their best first impression, some people will be a couple minutes late to interviews or submit something uh, a day late or say something's going to happen and then it doesn't. So even that, I mean, from, from the opposite perspective, if you're looking to, you know, get a job or something, it's just sticking to those commitments that you make and kind of meeting those expectations. This is literally just being dependable and doing what you say you're going to do is meeting expectations that will set you apart in fitness. And I feel like the hardest, yeah, this is another quote that I've heard. The hardest respect to earn is our own. But if you are able to be someone, especially in fitness, I'm going to work out four times this week. And you do, you're reinstilling that, that sense of accomplishment and sticking to your word. And that builds confidence. And then when you have so much evidence that you do what you say you're going to do, that's how you have evidence that you can then pack up and you can take to another field. So number one, first thing is just do what you say you're going to do. And you're going to be, you know, light years ahead. So number two, the next thing that I learned, or next thing that a lesson that's been very useful for me is I'm just going to say ownership. And I'll put this in the way that I wrote it. So all the things in your life that happen are not your fault, not your fault entirely by, by any means. There's always tons of variables, but act like they are. And so this was very helpful to me. Some of my favorite three books is Success Principles by Jack Canfield. So this was a big lesson from that. So that was a big lesson as well. So again, did not share that words. But ownership. So all the things in your life that happen are not your fault entirely, but act like they are because you'll have better outcomes. So again, those three books that I really like, Jack Canfield, Success Principles, 50 Cents Book, uh, Hustle Harder, Hustle Smarter. Um, and then Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. Really good books. And all of them kind of um, were early readings by me. And a lot of them stemmed, they had a part that was on ownership. And all it means though, or some stories to kind of, to kind of um, you know, paint the picture of this is, let's say a bad thing happens. You can blame someone or, or something, or you can find areas and say, hey, maybe I should have communicated that better. Where are my controllables that I could have shown up differently? And Example here, we're in the social media age, so 2024, the Instagram algorithm. I'm on Instagram live right now too, so hopefully you didn't hear that. Sorry, Mr. Mark Zuckerberg, but if I put out, let's say 20 content pieces this week, 
and they all flop. They don't do well. Man, the Instagram algorithm is just like, it's, it's just such a tough thing. Um, it's not pushing my content. It doesn't like me. Or I can try to control the controllable and taking ownership in a way and be like, no, I just got to, I got to post better content. Let me review the feedback and see how I can get a little bit better. And that's been more useful for me. Uh, I'm not saying I'm a social media expert by any means, but it just gives you that opportunity to see where your areas of inputs can be improved. And I feel that leads to better outcomes over the long term. And so, you know, years down the road, in terms of the algorithm thing, years down the road, which do you think is going to be more effective? Just saying it's the algorithm's fault or saying like, where can I improve my content? And if you stack up those 1% wins, those areas of opportunity, 10 years down the road, I would think you're going to be a better content creator at that stage. And now <laughs> I got a story on this one. So growing up, I played basketball in high school. And so freshman year of high school, I had, I tested this. I had a 16 inch vertical. If anybody you know knows in terms of basketball, I just kind of know where the NBA average is. Uh, it's like a 40 inch vertical, maybe a 35, 40 inch vertical. I believe that's around average in the NBA. So your boy probably wasn't going to make it to the NBA. I had a 16 inch vertical. And so I could have said, hey, my genetics are terrible for basketball. You know, it didn't strike out. I struck out in the genetic lottery. What's the point of even playing basketball? But for me, what was very helpful was I tried to take ownership and just see what are those controllables I can show up better. I did a jumping program. It was dunk now at the time. And I added eight inches to my, to my vertical. Um, and so I went from a 16 inch vertical to a 24 inch vertical. And so I wasn't jumping out of the building, but from my starting point, I was able to get a good amount better, or a good amount further by showing up and controlling those controllables. So for me, like again, outcomes, if I just said, oh man, it's my genetics, I got no chance, not even worth it. Or I said like, where are these areas of opportunity? How can I show up and, you know, maybe improve on the 16 inch vertical? I believe that that helped me hit more layups in basketball and actually make, you know, the team. So that was pretty cool as well. Um, so that was number two. We're talking about taking ownership. Great book that I love, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. Really, really good. Now let's go to number three. So number three is going to be, and this is going to be in, in business. This can be in whatever you do, whatever you want to improve in. So number three is going to be faster feedback loops equals faster results. And so what I mean by that, we're going to go straight into a fitness context. So if you only weigh in, if you only weigh in, let's say every 30 days, you weigh in once a month, you start this new fitness plan, you're eating better, you're eating quote unquote healthy. And you're like, I'm, I'm getting my steps up. And then you weigh in 30 days later and you're up two pounds. You just had 30 days of doing this thing that you thought was effective, but then it didn't get you where you wanted to go if the goal was weight loss. So you just kind of wasted those 30 days of where you could have been changing and learning and changing the implementations, changing those inputs to change those outcomes. But if we shorten that time frame of like, oh, I weigh in every 30 days because the, the thing I want to change is my body weight. If we reduce that kind of time frame from 30 days to review our data to one day or even weekly, we're going to get faster feedback so we can make changes and then we can redirect. We can redirect the ship and get to where we want to go. So faster feedback loops, having more data can be very useful. Now, here's a place where I messed this up. So in my company, we have um, introductory calls, and then we have you know our, our calls to uh, see if people are a good fit for the program, and we get enrolled on those calls. And this is for me just not listening to the data. And I was seeing that some of our texts weren't going out from a Google Voice number we were using. You're like, hey, it's interesting that you know just not getting a response to these text messages. And so I was like, okay, it, maybe it's just a, a funky thing. And then it took me like three, four weeks before I actually reviewed the numbers. And I was like, wait a minute, like we are seeing this many people interested in the program. And then we're just not seeing many intro calls for us to see if it's a good fit. Like what's going on here? And so finally, after like three or four weeks, me just lagging behind, I was like, okay, this is a priority. We need to get a different servicer for sending out these texts. Instead of Google Voice, we moved to a different thing and we were able to make contact more and give more opportunities to see if it's a good fit to get into the program. So that is somewhere where I was not listening to the data. I was not reviewing the data enough. I was just looking at it every once in a while. So faster data, faster feedback loops, faster results. And also just don't neglect the data. If you have the data, look at it. So that's something that I learned as well. And that's actually a more recent lesson. And so my next piece is going to be, so we're going to go number four. So number four is going to be, this is big. This is a big one. Expectations are everything. 
And I want to say in a way, undersell over deliver, but that's a tough piece because in undersell over deliver, that means that you're not really speaking to, you know, what you can actually accomplish or what someone may be able to accomplish. Like let's say in, in the program, in HFP, our, our 16 week program graduates average 19.6 pounds down in their first phase program. Um, so by setting expectations, let's say if we told everyone coming to the program, oh, you're going to lose 30 pounds. They lose 19.6. They're like, that's less than I was expecting. You're going to have, you're not meeting expectations. People are probably not so happy. But if you say, hey, you come to the program and let's say you lose 15 pounds on the scale. That'd be awesome, right? Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. So in 16 weeks, we can expect that to happen. Then they lose 20 pounds. What that average is, that's going to be more exciting. Okay. I exceeded expectations. I feel good. This is great. So it's interesting. Kind of the outcome can even be the same. 20 pounds, 20 pounds, but it's where the expectation was sent, which is going to give a long-term you know, imprint on kind of that experience. So expectations and everything is going to be very important. So be very strategic in the way that you set your expectations, um, especially if you say, I'm always on time and then you're late. Like, it's like you, you just said the thing and you didn't actually have the inputs for, for getting that. So very important that I feel that that's very strongly that expectations are everything. And here's another way where I've messed this up. I brought people, you know, I've, I've hired um, people onto my team and I just set the wrong expectations. I said that, hey, you know, my company is growing at X rate. We are in a great momentum swing, you know, in, in 12 months, 24 months, you could be here. And then the rate of growth actually slowed down. And so by getting all excited on, you know, what was the, the ideal outcome, the ideal outcome, you sell that kind of ideal destination, but then if things fall short, then it's kind of, you did not meet expectations, does not build great relationships. So let's take the flip. How to build great relationships is set proper expectations and to set proper expectations. We're going to talk about, you know, HFP, my program. If we can say people average 19.6 pounds down in their first 16 weeks, and we can back that up with data, that's a great outcome that can get people actually excited. So, and you can meet that expectation. So the big piece here is do great stuff, honestly, and you can make that the expectation. And that's how you make a good reputation. You stick by the expectations you set. You make sure that it's it's great value. And that's how you can really build a strong reputation. You stand by those things. Um, next up, we're going to go number five. Number five. And this is going to be, so number five is going to be, number five. Oh, I love this one. What's the alternative? So everybody has, I think they're called isms. I don't know if it's an acronym or what, but these little like one-liners that work very well. What's the alternative is one that I've loved. And I'll tell you how this came up. So number five is what is the alternative? And this came up. So one of my best friends, um, he asked me to get on a call one day. He was like, hey man, I, I see that. I feel that you, you've you been, you're a pretty disciplined guy. And I feel that I can, I can improve in that area. Would you mind getting on a call? And we're going to talk about, you know, strategies for discipline. I want to see how I can improve in this area. So I was like, okay, let's bring bring it up. And I got way more value, I feel, out of this call because I was able to kind of reflect on things that have worked for me and kind of try to systemize them a little bit. And so the question that came up for me with like discipline is usually it's going to be doing things in the short term that may not be so much fun, but you're doing yourself a favor in the long term. And so for me, something that's been very useful is we came up with this thing and just said, when you have these, these pieces these, these decisions to make, let's say, uh, do I want to get out of bed at 4 a.m. in the morning? Or let's say something that may resonate. Do I want to get this workout done? What's the alternative is the question I would ask. So let's say in my case, I'm getting out of bed. It's 4.15 a.m. I have a busy day scheduled. And uh, I'm like, oh, I really want to just sleep in another hour or two. Uh, and then I'll get out of bed at like seven or something. Um, and then what I, I have to ask myself, like, what's the, what's the alternative of of getting out of bed right now, getting a workout and feeling energized, feeling great for my day and having a win in the win column. The alternative, the alternative is I'm going to sleep in, not going to get my workout in because I'm busy the rest of the day. I'm not going to show up with the energy I typically do when I feel confident from, you know, having accomplished something early in the morning. And I just know for me, my days just are not as successful in my opinion, when I don't get that, that kind of leading indicator of a good day done. And so in the other case of like, maybe this something that will resonate here is, okay, do, do I go and work out after work? What's the alternative? I get home from work. I, I lay down, watch some Netflix. Uh, and then I go to bed and I'm just not happy that I didn't get my workout in or, or we get the workout done. We feel we moved and put a win in the win column. We feel better. And you're able to start looking at things 
when you ask yourself, what's the alternative, you start looking at the, the longer term picture because it's easy to get caught up in the weeds. What do I want to do right now? I want to eat the delicious snack. I want to take the relaxing route. We usually go through the path of least resistance and that's okay. But when we ask ourselves, what's the alternative? We start thinking of, okay, what happens one hour, two hours, three hours a day, a week later. And so that kind of just helps evaluate. So that's something I asked myself in the mornings. And that was something I learned from our call together, which I was supposed to help somebody else. And I think that it's ultimately, it was kind of more valuable to me. And that's another thing that we could even allude to is like the power of teaching really instills some of the things that we may already know, but a lot of times we have to be reminded more than we need to be told. Um, so that is one that I've really, really use. That's been useful for me. Um, next piece. And that's also like, what's the alternative? It's like, if you have a difficult conversation coming up, if you're like, do I post this content? Um, do I, do I, you know, take the chance? What's the alternative? And then just keep playing that timeline longer and longer. And then usually it helps you make those better short-term decisions. Number six, perspective is key. And I'm going to give you an example in this. We're going to tackle hunger and boredom. Both things that are quote unquote bad or of negative connotations. But let me tell you how like perspective is everything here. So we're going to tackle this in terms of, you know, hunger and boredom. Let's, let's tackle perspective on these. So when it comes to hunger, it's a bad thing. It's uncomfortable, you know, it's negative connotation. But when we think of it, if we're, our goal is to, let's say, lose body fat, lose, lose weight overall, hunger is going to be a part of the process. And what does hunger actually mean? It means that we have less nutrients coming in than, you know, we need. And if we're, our goal is to be in a calorie deficit, to lose body fat, to lose weight, um, hunger, feeling a little bit of hunger is positive reinforcement. It's a positive sign that you're in a calorie deficit. So if we're seeing some consistent hunger throughout the day that's not overbearing, this can actually be a good thing. Because let me let's play the opposite. If you're stuffed all day, like Thanksgiving dinner, um, and you cannot imagine eating a thing because you're so full, <laughs> the opposite of hunger, do you feel you are going to be successful in losing weight? Probably less likely if we're eating to, you know, feeling stuffed every meal. So in a way, we can look at the perspective of hunger, and now it's not so much a quote unquote bad thing. It just, it just is. That's also been a useful tip for me is things just are. It isn't good. It isn't bad. It just is what it is. Next piece on this is boredom. So boredom would be another piece where you can change your perspective on like how to look at it. Um, boredom, not good. You know, when things get boring, not a great thing. But boredom also, if we look at it from another uh, perspective, is if something that you do and want to get really good at starts becoming boring to you, it's boring because you're so proficient at it. You're getting better at it. It's just routine for you. Again, I used this before, but Kobe Bryant, he's not like this basketball thing is so exciting and so new. On his 100,000th 100, shot of basketball, he, it's not exciting anymore. He's bored. He's just doing the routines. And he was exceptional at basketball. And so by, by pulling that back, boredom isn't good. Well, boredom isn't bad. It can be not so great. Uh, if you're in like a history class and it's just running long uh, on the flip side, like boredom can be a good thing. It can be a sign that you're becoming an expert. It can be a sign that you're becoming proficient in the area that you, you want to be better at. So perspective is very, very important. And that was something that was useful to me. Number seven, the seventh lesson that I've learned in these last 30 years on this earth is the more you push to the end of your comfort zone, the more it expands. And so with this one is, again, kind of going back to the story in the beginning, I thought I peaked in high school. Coming into college, I was like, you know, I did cool things in, in high school. I thought that I peaked there. Going into, you know, college, I had no, I had no track record or evidence for, you know, who I was really because I was in this new area and no one wants to hear what I did, you know, the years prior. So I had to recreate myself. And so for that, I took on, you know, new challenges. And so that was getting into pharmacy school. We had 20 or 30 exam uh, semesters, becoming an RA, taking on um, sports, becoming co-founder of the powerlifting team. And these things kind of at each time when something was added, I felt that I'm spread too thin. This is too much. I need to chill. I need to do less. But everything just kind of, it reached a new kind of saturation point or it reached a new kind of level of normalcy. And that kind of helped me over time, progressive overload responsibilities but it just expanded that comfort zone. I was able to take on more responsibilities. And I feel that that really progressed over that time frame and allowed me to kind of handle, you know, life a little bit better nowadays. Um, because usually if you want to create your player in like a video game, probably the person who's a badass, it has been through some difficult challenges, has done a lot of things, has 
has been stressed out in the past just because they had a lot on their plate. So that person has that, that ability, has to go through some tough stuff to have those lessons. So I would say expand that comfort zone, get yourself challenged, take on new endeavors, host your Dungeons and Dragons, be the, the dungeon master, um, be the person who you know takes on uh, kind of those responsibilities and expand your comfort zone. Take on those responsibilities because I feel that's going to help you develop yourself and take on more over the long term. And this also, it helps you build an extra gear because if you go through a hard season of life, um, Nicole, when she worked at PSENG, they were doing like 16 hour work days or something. It was crazy. But now she knows she can always tap into that at a later time. She has this, this other gear that if something matters, something needs to be done, that gear can be tapped into. I think that's useful to have. Um, and it involves to create that gear, you have to go through some tough stuff. Number eight, many have done more with less. This is a mantra I had back in high school uh, that was very useful to me um, in terms of many have done more with less. So for me, in the whole basketball kind of scenario, um, or even say academically, math came easy for me. And so many have done more with less. There's people that were more academically accomplished that may not have had just, you know, the natural ability that math came easy to them. Um, that was what came easy, you know, reading and other things, maybe not so much, which I'm learning. Nicole reads books at like 4x the rate of me. I'm a slow reader. But math, math, hey, give me those five plus fives. You know, one plus one equals two. Um, so with that being said, if I didn't push myself and challenge or just didn't study for anything, I'm wasting the potential there. Because many have done more with less in that case where like maybe they just didn't, math didn't come easy, but they have more work ethic than me and they ran laps around me. So that was something that was useful to me and just like kind of helping me take advantage of opportunities. Many have done more with less. So help me step up to the plate and make sure I'm getting the most out of, you know, some of the things maybe I naturally gifted at when, and, and maybe there's other things I'm not so naturally gifted at, but the same thing of many have done more with less. It gives you that belief in yourself um, that maybe I'm not a naturally good reader, but there's people that have become very great readers that it didn't come naturally for them. So it just helps take advantage of opportunities. And for me, it was inspiring basketball kind of thing as well. I'm six foot two and early on I wanted, well, first I want to be a professional bowler. I couldn't get past when they got the bumpers taken away. So that didn't really happen. The second thing was I wanted to be in the NBA. I was on my road to being six foot two. Um, I'm not seven foot tall. So I wasn't going to play, you know, center or power forward, which I did in high school. But with that being said, there are NBA players that are like five foot 10, six foot one that I actually was taller than. So they actually made more of their height by their skills, their work ethic, than I actually was able to. And for me, that was inspiring. Um, my 16-inch vertical. <laughs> I don't know if there's anyone in the NBA that had a 16-inch uh, um, vertical. But I was able to put in the work ethic, get that to a 24-inch vertical. So kind of that was something that was useful to me, especially early on. Number, we are on number nine. Number nine. So number nine, thing that I learned by the age of 30, I wish I would have known earlier is, oh yeah. So gambling is cool, but have you tried betting on yourself? The cool thing about this, and I understand lottery tickets are cool. So for my birthday, my mom got lottery tickets, kind of thing she likes to do, and then we'll scratch them off. Fun times. But I'm kind of talking more so about like betting on yourself and how valuable that can be. So for me coming out of college, um, a big lesson for me was uh, yeah, betting on myself. So committed to trying to get into the pharmacy school uh, at Rutgers as a transfer. So doing the things that need to be done, bet on myself, got it done. So the bet that I made on myself that I want to tell you guys about in the story of this is when I was graduating pharmacy school, rotations were done. Um, I My dream job was always to be a fitness coach. I wanted to be a full-time fitness coach, something that I just loved. I loved uh, learning about nutrition, fitness, lifting weights. I love the progress that I, I had gotten from it. I love the confidence it helped build in myself. And I love teaching other people and helping them do it too. So my goal was to become a fitness coach. And at the time I was coaching already, but I knew to make a viable income for me to support my family, I was going to have to take on a hundred or 200 clients at once. And then my results wouldn't have been so good. I'd be spread too thin at that point. And so at that point, I was like, if I want to make this happen, I have time now before I have to do my licensing exams for pharmacy. So let me invest in a mentor. So I bet on myself, I spent $5,000 on a mentor. Everything I had besides $300 because I was working through college, I did. Uh, was working at CVS as a pharmacy tech, um, but I'm a frugal guy, so I was able to set it aside. And this is where I just, you know, just tossed it all to the wind. And I, but I bet on myself, and 
when we play the lottery tickets, you don't control the other the other side. It's just kind of like you put it through this equation and like, are you going to win or not? It's unlikely. But when we bet on ourselves, we control some controllables in the outcome because we can control how we show up when we bet on ourselves. So if you're wondering if you should take on that that challenging you know new job, if you're trying to learn that new skill, take on that difficult course, um, bet on yourself. But when you bet on yourself, give unwavering work ethic. Make it happen. So show up powerfully because you have controllables in that outcome. So make sure in the way that you show up and how you train yourself, the time you commit, the effort you give in that time, you can make some great things happen. So that was probably the best investment I made in my life because I bet on myself. And I remember learning all the modules. I was walking up and down the street back in Del Ran, just like listening it um, in my ear pods, just listening through the course content and then working through it. And, and ultimately, um, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have a mentor in my, in my corner. So with that being said, bet on yourself. But when you bet on yourself, show up powerfully. You can make big things happen. Um, this has been something too. Other examples. Clients in HFP, they bet on themselves. They've challenged, you know, for a long time. We've had people where they challenged, they were struggling 30 years to get their fitness goals accomplished, you know, losing those 20 pounds, couldn't figure it out, tried trainers, et cetera, et cetera. But they bet on themselves, they join the program, but then they show up big. They hit our 741 standard, they track every day, they show up to their workouts, they work out hard. Um, but just the right system, the right game plan, the right work ethic, you can accomplish some great things. Now, next up, we're going to go into, is this number 10? We're on number 10. Cool. Number 10. We got, oh, I love this one. So this is a quote. If no one makes the stuff, there is no stuff. This is actually a, a quote from Elon Musk. But if no one makes the stuff, there is no stuff. And so the way that this has changed my life, just hearing this quote, and I use this a lot to this day, is back in high school, I thought that everybody was having so much more fun than me. I thought that everybody would like, finish up at school, go hang out with everybody for three hours. And I was just that guy sitting at home watching SpongeBob. And SpongeBob has some great life lessons and it's it's enriched my life to this day. <laughs> There's so many uh, SpongeBob memes. But at that time I was like, man, like I'm just, I'm not, not that popular, not that cool because I'm not hanging out with too many people after school. I'm just hanging out with my sisters. I'm watching some, some cartoons and then, you know, just doing whatever the day kind of ends up being. And it was interesting to me though, is that everybody kind of had this similar experience or a lot of people that I know had a similar experience. They're like, yeah, I wasn't hanging out with people every day after school, but I thought that's what like, you know, the cool kids were doing. And so the reason that this has been useful to me and in that story too, I ended up winning homecoming King my senior year, but I thought that I wasn't hanging out with many people or people didn't know me, but I was just friendly to people in the hallways said hello and just pretty much, you know, um, yeah, just said thank you and held the door open for people. And so those kinds of things. So it was interesting to me that um, sometimes we think that everybody else is doing all this stuff. Sometimes we think that everything, all these things are happening, but there's no stuff if you don't make the stuff happen. So the story here is like, if you want to hang out with your friends, I mean, if you love hanging out with your friends, you know, hands raised, but if no one makes that date, sets that date, sets where you're going to hang out, it doesn't happen. So somebody has to make that kind of send out that text, ask people if they're free, get it all together, get to the sushi place. Someone has to make the thing happen. A uh, story here before we get into a bonus tip or a bonus lesson is, so on my mom's bucket list is going to Italy. And I, I kind of knew that if we never set a date to do this and go to Italy, it's going to be pushed and pushed and pushed. Um, great book, Bill Perkins, uh, Die With Zero. He talks about you know making sure when able-bodied to make sure that you're able to take on these experiences. And I know my mom is I think 62, 63 right now. So how long is she going to be super able to get the entire Italy experience? So if no one makes the stuff, nothing happens. So me and Nicole, we took it upon ourselves to, you know, set the date, send out the text, make, like, hey, are we, we're doing this next year. Can you do it? And then just set, set it out uh, 12 months in advance. And so we're going to knock that bucket list item off for my mom. So super excited about that. But kind of the story of this is you got to make the stuff happen. If you want to see... Uh, another quote is uh, Gandhi is um, be the change you want to see. So make those things happen. Be the leader. Set the event. If you want to, you know, there's a change you want to see. You got to make the thing happen. Um, and I think that this just has really helped me socially. This tip specifically, number 10, it's helped me socially because it's like, okay, if no one makes the hangout, if no one invites people over, people just don't hang out. So be that person in your social social setting to reach out, to set the coffee date, to get lunch, to get sushi, to have people over, to watch anime, et cetera. And then there's going to be more cool stuff to do. Um, but that lesson, I think, has been really useful for me 
again, on the social standpoint. Finally, I got a bonus for you guys. Bonus number 11. And this one is going to be the power, taking this one from Alex Hermosi, the power of 15 minutes of preparation. So the power of 15 minutes of preparation. So if you're going into a meeting, if you are about to host a FlexRx live, if you just take 15 minutes to condense your thoughts and give yourself, you know, uh, some notes to go off of, like I got all these notes, um, you can just sound like you sound like you know what you're talking about. You sound more eloquent because you just you've already kind of done this once before in your head. So it's the power of practice, but the power of having 15 minutes uh, of like preparation will make you just uh, excel uh, so much. Like the amount, the rate of improvements in how you will be able to give a presentation just from 15 minutes of that preparation rather than going in cold, it's exceptional because it can really connect your thoughts and you can really go step by step. Um, this has been helpful to me in running, you know, events like this to everybody and running this with the, our members of HFP, running our hot seats. And this has also helped me in, in our retreats as well, in terms of, you know, having to speak in front of everybody, just condensing my thoughts, making sure everything is prepared. Um, and it's been very useful. Uh, also, I told you guys earlier that I was uh, back in high school. I was class VP my senior year because I was scared of giving speeches. I was scared of public speaking, terrified. So I, was like, I don't want to be president anymore because I know that they have to say stuff at graduation. And so I had this giant fear. And the funny thing is when it comes to public speaking, and I'm, I would assume people can relate to that as well. It's not when I was talking in front of people. And I would stutter my way through pharmacy school and presentations, stutter my way through the, uh, the high school um, speech. But nowadays I've gotten, I believe better, but it's usually just because I'm more convicted in what I'm going to talk about. I know more, I'm more prepared. If I'm giving a presentation like this, I'm like, okay, I love talking about nutrition, macros, progressive overload, all these kinds of things. It's easier for me to talk in front of a lot of people because I have more of that certainty, that preparation. But in pharmacy school, if I'm a group of four people and I'm kind of like iffy on like what I put in there, I'm like, I think that's kind of right. Then I'm going to be stuttering a little bit and just hoping they're not calling on me. So again, 15 minutes of preparation. It can change the game in terms of like the way you show up to things. So that is my 10 takeaways by turning 30 that I hope are helpful for you guys. I sprinkled in some of the mistakes I've made along the way, but I hope that is helpful for you.